We've been studying the book of Hebrews for the past uh, few weeks. Today we come to the section on Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and how that impacts us in terms of our forgiveness of sins and our relationship with God. So, so we began with a two-week overview of Hebrews and now we are in the seven-week whirlwind tour through the book of Hebrews, going through about two chapters a week. So today we are looking at chapter 9 and also about two-thirds of chapter 10. Of these seven classes, four of these classes have been about Christology, which is the theology of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Right? And the other three classes are on application. Today we come to the last class on Christology, which is really the pinnacle of what Hebrews has to say about Jesus Christ. Now let's do a quick summary of what we have seen so far on Christology. Um, these are the four classes on Christology. The Hebrews author wants to basically teach his readers about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And why is he doing that? So that they will look to Jesus during uh, their time of trouble, in the middle of their challenges. So that's the reason he's presenting Jesus to his readers. Now the approach he takes is basically to present Jesus as superior to something else using the frame of reference. So first he talks about angels. So we looked at uh, how Jesus is better than angels, right? He's the son of God, the exact imprint of God. He's the creator and sustainer of the universe. It's also the heir of all things. He's the exalted messianic king. Now one thing to note here is that, and again Don had raised this question some time ago, He's the Son of God in two senses. One, He's the eternal Son of God. He is in every respect equal to God. And He's also the Son of God because He's the Son of David, the Messiah who's been enthroned. So we, when we see texts like, You are my Son, today I have begotten you. It's talking about the Son, that second aspect. Okay, moving on. So humans were destined to rule over creation, but we fail. So Jesus became fully human, overcame death, and one day he will share with us his reign over creation. Right? And he propitiated our sin, and even now he helps us during our temptation. These are benefits that he provides us that angels don't have and the same kind of benefits. Now moving on to the next class that we looked at Jesus, better than Moses, Joshua, and Aaron. Jesus is the faithful son in the house compared to Moses' servant in the house. Jesus is the builder of the house, and we are that house if we hold fast till the end. That's what we saw over there in terms of faithfulness. Jesus is faithfulness, our faithfulness. And he is the one who provides the eternal rest. And uh, he is not only the priest, he is also a king, unlike the priests in the Old Covenant. And he has been appointed the high priest, taken from among men, and he's been perfected through suffering and obedience. So these are some of the aspects about Jesus that we saw in our second class. And our third class on Jesus, we saw that he's a high priest, but he's a high priest of a different order, the order of Melchizedek. And when the priesthood is changed, the law is changed as well. Um, so he's a permanent high priest. Uh, his high priesthood is doubly sure because it's based on an oath. And he's in terms of his character, he's sinless, he's exalted to the right hand of the Father, and he's able, he's able to save to the uttermost everybody, everyone who draws near to God through him, and he continues to intercede for us. Right? And he inaugurates the new covenant, and we saw uh, the different benefits of the new covenant. There's transformed hearts, the restored relationship with God, there's a different kind of community, uh, and sins are truly forgiven. So this is what we have seen so far. Now today we continue on from here and uh, as we saw as the last week, he's the high priest but he's not just the high priest, he himself is the sacrifice as well that the high priest offers and that's what we're going to look at today. Now R.C. Sproul when talking to non-Christians would often ask this question, what do you do with your guilt? First there is subjective guilt and then there is the subjective guilty feelings or the guilty conscience. Now it's possible that some people, even though they are guilty, may not feel guilt. You know, on the one 
and there are psychopaths and sociopaths, but then there is a wide range of people whose conscience has been hardened enough that they don't feel the guilt in different degrees. Uh, now, be that as this may, we deal with guilt in different ways, right? We deny our guilt, or we rationalize or excuse our behavior, or we count on some kind of a payment or indulgence. This is the righteous, uh, I mean, the workspace righteousness mentality, that we can do this little thing and everything goes away. I mean, all of this shows a, a low view of our guilt in the sight of God. But biblically, uh, we see that the solution is really forgiveness from God, which truly clears our guilt, not only clears our guilt, clears our guilty conscience, so that we are enabled to really approach God in faith. And that's what uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10 are going to be addressing. So let's keep this in the back of our minds as we see the provision that God has made uh, in terms of how our guilt is cleared, how forgiveness of sins is accomplished. Let's begin by looking at quickly at the Old Covenant Tabernacle because the Hebrews author is going to talk about that in chapter 9. The Tabernacle was a portable structure as, as Israel was wandering in the wilderness, right? It consisted of a courtyard and a tent. And the tent had two uh, compartments, the holy place and the most holy place, which is sometimes also called the holy of holies. People would enter through the courtyard through one gate and uh, there were tables for slaughtering animals as they entered the courtyard. And then there was an altar for doing the sacrifice. But then the tabernacle itself had very restricted access. So as we look at the interior of the tabernacle, it's made of wood but overlaid with gold. Then there's these two sections, the holy place, which is uh, the first section, and it contained things like the golden lamp stamp, the table of the bread of the presence, and so on. And then there's the most holy place, which contained the Ark of the Covenant, and on top of that there's a mercy seat, and that is the place of meeting between God and man. There's two veils, one veil in between the holy place and the most holy place. The veils are these, these thick curtains and there's this other, the other thick curtain between the courtyard and the entrance into the holy place. Right? So this is kind of the setup. Now, as we look at chapters 9 and 10, the first section that we see is what is the problem with Old Covenant worship? Now the Hebrews author is very logical and so he first lays out the problem before he gets to Jesus and what Jesus has done. So he's going to actually focus on the tabernacle, not on the temple. Probably because uh, you know when the old covenant was given to Moses, God provided instructions with respect to the tabernacle. And later when they built a permanent structure of the temple, the same ideas carried over into the temple as well. Okay, so Hebrews 9 begins with really a, a description of worship in the tabernacle. He describes two things, the regulations for worship and uh, the physical arrangements or the earthly places of holiness. What is in the holy place and then what is in the most holy place. That's what he describes in this first paragraph there. And then he moves on to these regulations of, for worship, how these things happen. So let's look at this from verse 6. These preparations have been made. The priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. And into the second section, only the high priest goes, and only once a year. And he takes blood, which he offers for himself, and then unintentional sins of the people. Right? So, as we see here, there is a very restricted access to God that we see in this old covenant worship setup. Right? Because the high priest can go into this most holy place only once a year and also the Hebrews author gives a commentary here that the, by this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as that first section is still standing. As long as the setup is there, this really indicates that the way into the holy place, access to God is really restricted, it's really limited. And not only that, there's no good relief for the guilty conscience. So these gifts and sacrifices, they cannot really perfect the conscience, right? This is all about external washings and food and drinks and stuff like that. But these are not able to really wash the conscience of the worshiper. And that guilty conscience really becomes a barrier 
between the worshipper and the God. And God. Right? So these are the two issues that he points out with the old covenant worship before he really presents what Jesus has done and how that's going to address this. Okay, now he gets to the solution. He's going to lay out the solution in a summary form in the next four verses, right? Chapter 9, verses 11 to 13. He gives two short summaries and then he's going to expand on that. Okay, so 11 to 12, he f lays out the first point, which is what Jesus has uh, objectively done, right? The superiority of Jesus and what Jesus has done. And the second part, verses 13 to 14, is what is the effect this has on us, okay? Now, he, he mentions three things on what Jesus has objectively done, right? And how that is distinct or different from the Old Covenant sacrifice. The place where the Jesus sacrifice was offered, the frequency, and the means of the offering. First, Jesus is offering, but when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, he, the, through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, not of this creation, so he made the offering in this heavenly sanctuary. He entered once for all into the holy places. Not by means of the bl of blood, or blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood. So these are the three aspects that distinguish Jesus' sacrifice from the Old Covenant sacrifice. And the result of that is that he was able to secure an eternal redemption. So that's uh, the first summary. The second summary is the effect of the sacrifice. He mentions the effects on us, which is how it purifies us and how we have access to God. So again, for if the blood of goats and bulls, the sprinkling of def defiled persons, ash of the heifer, all of these were meant uh, for the purpose of ceremonial cleansing. So he argues from a lesser to the greater, right? So these kind of a thing were able to accomplish a ceremonial cleansing. How much more will the undefiled, um, pure um, blood of the sun without blemish, how much more will that cleanse us? How much more will that be able to purify our conscience and be able to give us access to serve the living God? So he's going to now expand on that first uh, summary in the rest of chapter 9. And then he's going to rest, expand on the second aspect in chapter 10. Okay, so that's the way we're going to approach chapter 9 and chapter 10. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So going f uh, on to the rest of chapter 9, the first thing that we see here is Jesus' blood and also how the new covenant and the blood are related, right? So that's the first topic we'll look at. <clears throat> so first of all, why blood? Um, you know, we who live in 21st century Western countries, it seems very pagan, right? And how is that related to forgiveness? And how is this covenant come into the picture and all of that, right? Let's read this verse from Leviticus, where God says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your sins, or for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the life. What does this mean? Saying life is in the blood, sin against God is punishable by death, and the life blood of the person is required when that happens. So there's a seriousness associated with sin, and uh, there's a connection between blood and life and death. So through this, God makes a provision that the death of an animal can function as a substitute for the death of a human being. So that's what we see in Leviticus here and through the Old Covenant uh, sacrificial system. So this substitutionary aspect that an animal can function as a substitute and because of that substitute, the human is absolved of the death that they are due. That's the idea that we start seeing in the Old Covenant. So the animal suffers the fate that the human deserve, right, which is death. And that death of the animal also shows the seriousness of sin and the great cost of forgiveness. 
So, as we see here in verse 22, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Looking at this section, we are struck by how many times the word blood is mentioned. Right? And also, how many times death is mentioned. So, it's, it's, it's repeatedly that we see that all over here, as I've highlighted here. Moving on to the idea of covenant, in our last class we saw that the new covenant was inaugurated by Jesus and these are the benefits of the new covenant and so on. Now, let's take a quick look at how this new covenant is established. Now, the old covenant, as we see here in verse 18, the old covenant was inaugurated with blood. Uh, so, Moses sprinkled this blood when the old covenant was inaugurated. In like manner, in verse 15 we see, Therefore, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised inheritance, since the death has occurred that redeems them from all these trans transgressions. So the idea here is that Jesus is mediator of this covenant between God and man through the blood sacrifice that he has made. So you see the parallel between that substitutionary atonement that was there in the old covenant and uh, how Jesus is that blood sacrifice that initiates the new covenant just like how the old covenant is initiated by these animal blood, blood sacrifices. So now this new covenant is a better covenant because it is established by the shedding of Jesus' own blood right? and it's a more effective covenant resulting in this promised inheritance and is able to redeem us from the transgressions that we have committed. And next there is this talk about the will that also is a little bit confusing at first glance. Now in the Greek language, the same word is used for both covenant and will. Now we've seen that the old covenant and the new covenant were both inaugurated with blood or death. Right? So that is similar to how a will becomes effective after death. Right? So he's using a play on words on covenant and will and he's uh, bringing this idea that Jesus' death inaugurates the new covenant, it also results in an inheritance for us, right? this promised eternal inheritance that we're talking about here. So, keeping this idea of covenant and blood in mind, now as we come to the Lord's table in communion, we hear Jesus' words, this is the new covenant in my blood. Right? So, uh, I think it's helpful to keep this in mind, this whole structure in mind as we see that Jesus is inaugurated this new covenant because of what he did on the cross. He died on the cross and through that we have been brought into this new covenant relationship with God. And that's what we are thinking about when you are coming to communion and listening to Jesus' words about the new covenant. Okay. Hope that makes sense. Alright, moving on to the next two aspects about the heavenly sanctuary and the once for all sacrifice. Let's look at the following section in chapter uh, 9. Okay. So in the old covenant, the copies of the heavenly things were purified with these rites, the old covenant rites. But Jesus, through his much superior sacrifice, has entered the heavenly sanctuary into the very presence of God himself. Right? So there is this, that contrast of what happened in the earthly sanctuary and what is happening in this heavenly sanctuary. So the old covenant high priest, he entered the most holy place with the blood of animals to represent the people of Israel. But Jesus has entered the presence of God himself in the heavenly sanctuary to represent us. So the result is that we have a better representation than what the Old Covenant provided for through Jesus. And also, there's a better purity because the Old Covenant, the blood sacrifice, could only purify these copies of this heavenly sin. Whereas, the purity that Jesus provides is through a more perfect sacrifice. And also, we have better access to God because Jesus has entered in the print of the presence of God himself and as we saw in chapter 6 there was this metaphor of the anchor and the direct line that we have into the very presence of God. Right. So 
that, that those are some things to keep in mind as we think about Jesus entering the very presence of God in the heavenly sanctuary and how that should give us confidence as we think about Jesus ministering to us, Jesus entering in the heavenly sanctuary. And then this next aspect about the once for all sacrifice. So the, the old covenant high priest sacrificed his animals and took uh, into the most holy place every year, right? But Jesus doesn't offer the sacrificial blood repeatedly. And by the way, that's why the Catholic Mass with this idea of a repeated sacrifice over and over again, and that's why that is really unbiblical and that, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's serious error. Um, because Jesus is not being sacrificed over and over again. It was a once for all sacrifice that he did. Okay. So Jesus put away sins once for all. And he took one offering to the heavenly sanctuary. Uh, and that was it. Because it was totally effective. And there's no re need to repeat it over and over again every year. Now the author does another, Hebrews author does another analogy. And he says in verse 27. Just as it is appointed for man to die once, right? So we die once, there's no reincarnation. It's not like we die and then we're born again and then we die and born again. In like manner, Jesus also, it's a one-time sacrifice. He's not going to enter the sanctuary and come back and offer, uh, offer another sacrifice, go in like the high priest. It's not going round and round over and over again. So that's the idea that he's saying. And... Uh, like how the Old Testament people were awaiting the high priest coming out of the sanctuary. We also eagerly are awaiting for Jesus to come out of that heavenly sanctuary, right? So now he connects that to the second coming of Jesus. So likewise, he will appear a second time, not to deal with sin. He's not going to come back and do some more of sacrifices, offering sin and all of that. He's coming back to bring the final salvation for those of us who are eagerly awaiting him. So I think it's helpful to compare this Old Covenant High Priesthood and Jesus' priesthood because this is really a great encouragement to us, right? As we see Jesus' once-for-all sacrifice, that it's, it is sure and an effective sacrifice. It doesn't have to be repeated. You know, imagine the Old Covenant people, their, their High Priest has gone and he comes back and then next year they have to go and do this thing all over and again. We don't have to do that. Jesus has done one for all, it's a one-time sacrifice and our, our sins are completely taken care of. Right? So that should be a great encouragement as we see this parallel, as we see what Jesus has done. Hopefully that will help us to cement what Jesus has done more clearly in our minds. Okay, now moving on to the next section of the effect on us. Right. So in, in chapter 10, Basically, the, the author kind of repeats what he's been saying so far, but from a different perspective, from the perspective of the subjective effect of what Jesus' sacrifice has on us. Uh, and again, he begins with the same, uh, the, the problem under the law. Right? The law couldn't really cleanse because the law is, first of all, just a shadow. Of, and the same sacrifices continually offered every year could not make perfect. Uh, or it could not really cleanse, as we see here. And uh, the guilty conscience could not have assurance because people still continued to have the consciousness of sins. There was no relief. The, the reminder of sins was just over and over again. So he, again, he restates the problem, but again, from more giving more emphasis on the, on the side of the guilty conscience, how it affects us. From verse 5, in this next uh, few verses, what we see here is that even in the Old Covenant, God's ultimate desire was not these external sacrifices, but rather a changed heart that desires to obey God. Right? So the idea of obedience is better than sacrifice is something that we see in multiple places in the Old Testament. So I've listed a few verses here from chat. First Samuel, Psalms, and uh, Hosea. So in this section here, he quotes from Psalm 40, where we see the displeasure that the Father has with the Old Testament sacrifices. See, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, 
burnt offerings and sin offerings and they take no pleasure. Now, he then applies it to Jesus Christ typologically. So, the Hebrews author present these words, the response to the Father, as the words spoken by the Son to the Father, as the Son prepares to enter into the world. So he says, sacrifice and offering you not desired, but a body you have prepared for me, and behold, I have come to do your will. So he presents this as Jesus' response. The Father is not pleased with just the sacrifices. What he desires is really obedience. And Jesus picks up on that and Jesus obeys the Father. That's the way he picks up as a typology of what we see in Psalm 40 being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So as a, as a result of this obedience, he fulfills and replaces the Old Testament sacrifices. As we see here in verse 9, he does away with the old, with the first in order to establish the second. So the point is, these eternal sacrifices which were ineffective to change the heart, right? they have been replaced because of Jesus' obedience. And that has ultimately resulted in us being able to have in this inward change. And that's what God ultimately wanted in the first place anyway. God's desire was not sacrifices, but God's desire was a changed heart that will obey Him. So, so He connects that Psalm 40, the God's obedience is better than sacrifice, Jesus' obedience, the replacement of sacrifice, sacrificial system, and how that results in us being able to have this changed heart and ultimately have that obedience to God. Right. So, so here he says that by that will and through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Right. So, and we also already saw what is that will in, in that the, the will is I have come to do your will, the will of God. And the body is the one, the body of Jesus that was offered. Through this, we have been sanctified. So that is his ultimate point. All right. Now moving on to the next section from verse 11 onwards, we continue to see the same aspect but from just a slightly different perspective and here we see and the, 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 the way that Jesus has done this trans, heart transformation is through a different kind of priesthood. So we see this contrast of the two kinds of priesthood. The Levitical high priest standing in his incomplete and effective work and Jesus the high priest who seated this complete effective work. So last week we, uh, we discussed Psalm 110 verses 1 and 4. So here we again see some reflections from Psalm 110 where as a king he sat down at the right hand of God until his enemy should be made a footstool at his feet. And as a priest he has offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. And the result of this sacrifice is that by this single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Right? So uh, Jesus is a different kind of priest and he's a king and a priest. He makes this under this Melchizedekian priesthood, he's an eternal priest, one time offering and the effect of the one time offering is that it, he has perfected for all time, all of us. He has bring, he's brought about sanctification and cleansing for us. Then we also talked about the new covenant last week. Uh, now he repeats a couple of the promises of the new covenant. I will put my laws in their hearts, write them in their minds, this is the transformed heart, and I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more, the true forgiveness. These are the benefits of the new covenant. Because this has been accomplished, the effect on us is that there is no longer any offering for sins and we have, we can have true assurance that our sins are truly forgiven and uh, there is no need for any more offering. Our guilty conscience is truly cleansed because of what Jesus has done. Okay. And that enables us to be able to draw near to God, to approach God, which we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise if, our, if we still had our guilty conscience, if our sins were still weighing heavily on us. Okay. And that's the final section that we look at so finally, 
Jesus' sacrifice does give us this access to God because the barrier is removed. The problem with the old covenant barrier that he mentioned at the beginning of chapter 9 is no longer there. So in this final section that we're looking at, verse 19 onwards, he begins with uh, two assertions. And based on these two assertions, assertions he's going to give three exhortations of what we should do. Right? The first assertion or the first reason for doing this is we have a, high, a great high priest over the house of God. And the second one is we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the cut. Because of these reasons, now he's able to say these three exhortations. First, let us draw near with the true heart and full assurance of faith. And second, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Third, let us consider how to stir up one another in love and good works, not neglecting to meet, meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So Christianity is not a lone ranger religion, you know, we should we draw near to God individually, but we also draw near to God corporately as the body of Christ. Right? And also it's interesting to see here the Christian triad of faith, hope and love, how we see these three things in these three exhortations. Uh, Paul is very fond of using these three and here we see the Hebrews author um, bringing these three as well. There's also a parallel passage we see at the end of chapter 4. Chapter 4 was about the eternal rest that Jesus provides and at the end of that he gave uh, an exhortation and gave these two reasons and we see how so similar it is and over there also we see the two reasons we have a great high priest and this great high priest has sent passed through the heavens he's entered in the heavenly sanctuary because of these reasons let us hold fast our confession and uh, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace so the faith assurance of faith and the hope uh, that we are looking forward to right? these aspects so, with that, let us uh, conclude. To add to our Christology of whatever we, what we have studied in the past, today what we've seen is that Jesus secures our eternal redemption through his once-for-all sacrifice. He redeems and purifies us by his own blood. And he has opened this new and living way to God that we can access God. We are free to, we are able to draw near to God. And he has entered the heavenly sanctuary. He is in the heavenly sanctuary right now. And then one day he is going to come back and bring that final salvation. That's what we are eagerly looking forward to.